every major victory in war is a result of long planning, long preparation, with the loss of often thousands of men. But uh, when something comes along that is unexpected and you have this great prize, now it is a great alarm. In the other cases, you've expected it, you've planned for it. And uh, here, you come along with something that gives a great lift to the morale of the whole force, everybody. I think from private up to uh, uh, our bosses in Washington and London knew that the war was over. Every one of us realized that if Hitler had the slightest sense, he would immediately surrender. But it was a, the gallantry of the men that did it is something that should never be forgotten. And uh, uh, their names really ought to be in some, uh, uh, I'd say, permanent place in the niche of uh, fame that the American uh, uh, government should like to keep. People of Remagen loved their bridge. They loved it because it was an attraction for visitors from all over the countryside. And they loved to stroll across it on Sunday afternoons to have picnics near the site of it. And they're right proud of the fact that the bridge was a strategic link between the German Ruhr on the north and the Saar Moselle region on the south. Everybody knew that it would take a long amount of planning to cross the Rhine River because this was the big natural barrier between the Siegfried Line and the straight shot toward Berlin. So even before we landed in Normandy, the Supreme Headquarters began to lay its strategic plans. To explain the strategy for crossing the Rhine, a little background is necessary. Uh, Hitler still had, at that time, a very uh, strong army and strong armed force west of the uh, Rhine. And uh, we counted on the, almost the certainty that he would not allow them to withdraw when, he saw, when they saw their uh, situation to be uh, hopeless and um, take the bulk of their forces back across the Rhine and therefore um, defend that uh, very great obstacle in such a way that we would have a very terrible time to get across. So um, we began to plan the basic, or what you might say the power crossing of the uh, Rhine for a crossing just to the north of the Ruhr. This would be in the, uh, in the uh, zone of the 21st Army Group under uh, General Montgomery and uh, to that force, I had attached the 9th Army under General Simpson to uh, reinforce uh, Montgomery's blow. Well, and of course, we, made, uh, we gave him a considerable time to prepare for that, uh, you might call formal or power crossing. In the meantime, however, we went about the business of destroying the German forces west of the Rhine, and this was a series of blows that had been uh, taken up first in the way to the north and into Bat, uh, Bradley's army group and finally down into the uh, army group of Devers which had both a French army and an American army 
in his command. There was considerable argument as to how we should cross the Rhine when we reached the West Bank. The British argued, particularly Marshal Montgomery, that we should cross only in the north and make our attack north of the Ruhr toward Berlin. The maximum number of divisions you could supply on that narrow front was something like 25, but he wanted to take these divisions and let the rest of us stay on the west bank in a defensive position. The Americans argued that that was no way to do it, that we should advance on a broad front so that the Germans could not concentrate against us on a narrow front. And with a broad front, we'd have better mobility and uh, could uh, probe and secure the places where they were weakest. So that uh, my plan was to cross the first army just south of the Ruhr and the third army under Patton to cross down somewhere near Koblenz and then join them together and attack to sweep around the south and east side of the Ruhr and connect up with the 9th U.S. Division, which at that time was under Monty, uh, on the east side of the Ruhr and then clean up the Ruhr. As a matter of fact, we did do that later and secured something like 368,000 prisoners in the Ruhr. At the end of February 1945, the 9th Armored Division, having been re-equipped and received replacements, was moved up behind the, the First Army and attached or assigned to the Third Corps and crossed the Ruhr River north of the dams. We then moved out onto the Rhine Plain where we encountered small pockets of resistance, which was primarily the, that of the anti-aircraft defense guns which had been lowered so that they could fire as anti-tank guns. Owing to the lack of cover and the very flat terrain, this, this was a very serious obstacle, but we were moving forward at the rate of five to ten miles an hour. One of the reasons that the Americans made such great progress toward the Rhine was the fact that Hitler insisted that every position be held to the last man. This meant that the Americans could bypass a good many of these strong points which the Germans had set up in the Rhineland. There was great confusion in the German defenses at Remagen on March 7, 1945. Captain Friesenhahn, the engineer commander, had been sent to Remagen in 1943 to assume command. He was replaced by Captain Brodke as the top commander who came in 1944. These two commanders tried in vain to sort out the miscellaneous set of units that kept filtering through Remagen. As the Americans, As the Americans approached Remagen in early March, I had at my disposal, in the bridgehead of Remagen, one sapper company of 125 men. The sappers were assigned to the planking of the railroad bridge in order to make it passable for motor vehicle traffic. The men had to work day and night in order to complete the bridge. Besides these men, the bridge defense company was also under my command. It consisted of 35 men, convalescents, all of whom were still under treatment. Some of these men were not even able to manipulate a gun because, of course, they had stiff limbs. 
The town of Remagen had some advantages for both the attacker and the defender. From the standpoint of the attacker, there was high ground going into the town where you could direct operations from. But it was very easy to defend Remagen because of the crooked and narrow streets and particularly the 600 foot high cliff on the opposite side of the Rhine which provided wonderful observation for 10 miles around from which the defender could see anybody approaching the town. On the morning of March 7th, we received orders and were given maps covering the area leading to Remagen. We noticed on the map the bridge of the Ludendorff Bridge. No one paid any attention to this bridge on the map because we had received no orders pertaining to the bridge or the capture of the bridge. All we were told was that we would attack the town of Remagen, take it, and then swing south, try, trying to connect up with Patton's Third Army. Progress was not too fast. It was just 10 miles to the Rhine, but it took considerable time to get there. We met up with some so-called light resistance, but I've always felt that a 30 caliber bullet aimed at the right spot is just as heavy resistance as an artillery shell if, if the man dies from it. Realizing that the Rhine was our mission, we looked forward with some anticipation, of course, of reaching this historical river. Some of us recognized that the Rhine itself had a great deal of impact on the outcome of the war, that it had to be crossed, but how it was to be done, uh, we were not advised. And it was hoped that when we did reach the Rhine, that we would be given a break, being an armored outfit, that uh, we would not be able to get across the Rhine until some type of bridging had been established. Early in March of 1945, there was a whole series of new company commanders in Company A of the 27th Armored Infantry Battalion, where Carl Timmerman served as a platoon leader. The advance along the Rhineland toward Remagen resulted in a number of casualties to the officers, and on the night of March the 6th, Carl Timmerman was tapped to be the next company commander of Company A. His orders were to capture the town of Remagen and then to stop. By the morning of the 7th of March, along about 11.30, Carl Timmerman saw a great deal of excitement up ahead on the edge of the woods. He gunned his jeep, went to the edge of the woods, and looked down on the broad Rhine River and there he saw the electrifying sight of a bridge still standing, the Ludendorff Bridge, a bridge which the Americans never expected to find standing. Around 10.20 a.m., the entire front line of the American infantry had reached the edge of the Remagen Bridgehead. Our bridge defense company opened fire with rifles and machine guns upon which the American infantry forces retreated and for the time being everything remained quiet. About 11.15 a.m. a major in general staff uniform arrived and introduced himself as Major Schurler. Major Schurler told me that he had orders to take over command at Remagen. At that moment, I breathed a sigh of relief because I thought, now we will get the promised additional battalions. My first question was, where are the battalions? Major Schurler looked at me in surprise and asked, which battalions? Now it was my turn to look surprised, and I almost suspected that something was not quite in order. When Timmerman first saw that the Remagen Bridge was still standing, his first reaction was, let's get some artillery down on that, because look at all those German vehicles and troops that are crossing. 
However, the order came back from higher headquarters, nothing except air bursts would be fired at that bridge, since it's still standing. Timmerman was then ordered by Colonel Engelman, the task force commander, to make a reconnaissance down into Remagen, which he proceeded to do. The tanks and infantry then attacked the town. The infantry moved, hugging close to the walls of the buildings of the town, cleaned it out within two hours. While the troops were moving into position for the attack on the bridge, we captured a number of soldiers, civilians, and some railroad people in uniform. The rumor came back to me that several of these reported that the bridge was to be blown up at four o'clock. I don't think there was any truth in that, but at the time, I informed the task force commander, Colonel Engman, that he should speed up his attack since the bridge was supposed to be blown at four o'clock. It was then about 3.30. Major Devers, the infantry battalion commander, asked Lieutenant Timmerman, you think you could get your company across that bridge? Timmerman said, well, we can try. Devers said, go ahead. Timmerman asked, what if the bridge blows up in my face? The battalion commander didn't answer, he just walked away. In fact, nobody ever answered the question, what if the bridge blows up in my face? While these troops were taking their position on the west bank of the Rhine along the bridge, an explosion occurred in the causeway leading to the bridge. This threw up a great quantity of dirt and smoke, and afterwards I saw it, and it was about 30 feet in diameter, and formed an obstacle to the crossing of vehicles. A powerful detonation occurred on the left bank of the Rhine, immediately behind the bridge. I did not know how to explain this. Captain Friesenhahn, the bridge commander, had blasted the dike on the other side of the bridge, at the ramp of the bridge, a demolition which had already been envisaged. This was a sign to me that the Americans were approaching. But so far as the, the main demolitions were concerned, something very peculiar happened on the morning of the 7th of March. Friesenhahn and Brodka had ordered some reserve TNT in order to arm the explosives. When the truck came up on the morning of the 7th of March, Brodka and Friesenhahn were horrified to discover that they had gotten just about half as much explosive as they had been promised. And in addition to that, it was an industrial type of explosive known as Donorit instead of the military explosives, which was far more powerful. Captain Friesenhahn was calling from the tunnel entrance. Captain Bradke, Captain Bradke, combat commander! I rushed over to him. Still completely out of breath, he reports to me, the Americans, they're the Bishop Timbermen. This mill was located immediately behind the Rhine. In other words, they had reached the bridge. I told him, Friesenhahn, blast the bridge, blow it up! I, I, I have no permission. Major Schoeller is the only one who can give the order for demolition. At that moment, Major Schoeller was on the other side of the tunnel, 350 meters away from us, only to be reached on foot. So I dashed off through the dark tunnel to Major Schoeller. I reported to him, the Americans are going to cross the bridge. Major Schoeller is very calm. I said, Major, 
If you don't give orders to blast the bridge, I will do so. Then go ahead. Have the bridge blasted. I ran back to Captain Friesner. Back again through the dark tunnel. Again, minutes passed before I could reach him. As soon as he could, hear me, I called out to him. Friesenhan, blow up the bridge! Friesenhan shouts. Full cover! Full cover! Everybody in the tunnel lies down flat on the ground in order to escape the tremendous blast we expected. As far as we know, we actually saw the bridge lift up off its foundation. There was dust and debris thrown all over, and after a while, you couldn't see the bridge anymore. Uh, it wasn't too long. The dust cleared. The bridge was still standing. And Timmerman said, okay, move out. Instinctively, my hand comes to my neck. I know. If the bridge doesn't go down into the water, my life will be at stake. Something has to happen. I rush back to Major Schurler and report to him. Demolition of the bridge has failed. But I had hardly reached him when someone called again through the tunnel. Captain Bradke, combat commander up front. It grows louder and louder. Major Schurler says, have a look what is going on. Again, I run back through the tunnel, through the masses of civilians, passing men, women, children. Soldiers are amongst them. I reach Friesen. Friesenhan already shouts, Americans across the bridge. That was all we needed. Come on, Friesenhan. A few men from the Sapper units. Counterattack. There can't be many of them. We have to throw them back. But uh, I've already tried it. We wanted to get out immediately. But look, the tremendous gunfire aimed at the entrance of the tunnel. One grenade after another. You can't subject anybody to that. No one will get out alive. Friesenhand, there is only one possibility. Escape through the other end of the tunnel, across the dam, a counterattack. The Americans have to retreat. I rush back to Major Schurler. Report to him. Americans are crossing the bridge. Major, you have to prepare for an immediate counterattack. I will get the people out of the tunnel. Do you want to get them out? No, Bradka. You go ahead. I enter the tunnel. Get hold of a sergeant. Summon everyone who still carries arms. Here, one, two, three, four, nine men. Sergeant Foner. Run along, get me nine men. Major Scheller still has two lieutenants with him. He should put them into action. In the meantime, I look for some more men. Sergeant Fernal leaves. I shout, get them together. I have five men now. Fernal comes back. Major Scheller isn't there. It's, it's impossible, I think, myself. And I even barked at Sergeant Fernal in a rather irritated manner. Open your eyes! He is standing right there at the entrance to the tunnel. He is aggravated and replies, that isn't so. He's gone. What to do now? I accompany him to the entrance of the tunnel. Major Schurler is gone. He left the tunnel together with the two lieutenants in the direction of Funke. That was the last thing I could make out. Immediately, I, I make an announcement. I am taking over. Come back, command at once. I run back to Friesenhahn. He will have to know what is going on. I tell him, Friesenhahn Schurler is gone. I don't know why he left. Now we have to get all the men who are still in here out of the tunnel, gather everyone near Ostberg and launch a counterattack. There is no other alternative left. Friesenhahn agrees. Friesenhahn and I push all the men from the back to the front in order to evacuate the whole tunnel. The first soldiers leave the tunnel. Hand grenades were straight in front of them. Gunfire, machine gun fire hits the tunnel entrance. The Americans have crossed the mountain terrain. They have the tunnel exit. How that was possible, I still can't understand up to this day. How many times did I climb this mountain? What an effort it was. That was not only a good military achievement, but also a commendable physical accomplishment of our comrades on the other side. 
Now, unknown to the German commander, Captain Brodke, on the afternoon of March 6th, the day before the Americans reached Remagen, this anti-aircraft unit was replaced and sent down to Koblenz. The unit that came in to take its place never did get up to the top of the hill on the 7th of March. Since the Bear Bridge was standing, I directed the task force commander to move the infantry across the bridge. While watching their progress over the bridge, I received a radio message from the division stating that previous missions were canceled and that Combat Command B was to move south across the Ara River in the direction of Koblenz and join up with the units of the 3rd Army which were moving north from that direction. I did not know how, exactly how to react to this since we were in process of capturing a bridge over the Rhine which I believe to be of considerable value to our forces. On the other hand, it was a direct violation of orders not to call off this attack and proceed to the south. There seemed to be one way of getting out of this dilemma and that was for the bridge to fall. So I stood on the hill and watched the bridge until the infantry battalion had reached the far bank. My next thought was that I should get back and contact higher headquarters and tell them what the situation was, that I had disobeyed their orders and received confirmation for the action which I had taken. When I received this uh, phone call from Hodges, uh, it was one of the best pieces of news we'd received for some time. It was a great satisfaction that we had been able to capture this bridge, and I expect I was somewhat excited about it. And uh, I, as soon as I finished talking to Hodges, I called Eisenhower. He was very excited about it, and uh, we both realized this is very fine news. It would save us the trouble and expense and casualties of making an assault crossing of the Rhine, and it really was uh, one of the nicest things that happened to us during this period. Well, I shouted with glee, of course, and I told uh, Bradley, well, look, um, we were going to uh, capture Cologne with uh, an allotted uh, four or five divisions to that, and uh, Cologne surrendered. Uh, you've got those right handy. They're not allo allotted now to any other mission. Why not get them across? Well, he said, that is exactly my plan, but I just wanted to check in with you. And I said, all right, we agree. You get over there just fast as you can. And uh, he, they did. This, uh, I forget the name, the numerical designation of the Corps, but they went over very rapidly. I uh, received the news that we had captured Remagen Bridge uh, while I was sitting in my headquarters in Namur. At the time... General Bull from Chafe headquarters was in my office and I passed the news on to him and uh, we discussed the advantage of it. Of course, when Hodges, the first army commander, phoned the message in to me that we had received it, I told him to shove troops across and secure the bridgehead, taking whatever troops across were necessary and uh, so we could hold that bridgehead for future operations. This uh, bridge enabled us to get across the Rhine here without having to make an assault later on and uh, really made a decision to cross on a wide front easier for Eisenhower to make.
When we received the orders that we would have to cross the bridge, the thing that struck me was the length of the bridge and the Erpele on the other side of the bridge, which had very commanding ground for the German army to defend if they had the soldiers over there to defend it. As to my men, I believe I had the best men in the army and the best fighting platoon within the army at that time. We go to heaven to for each other. From our position on the west bank of the Rhine, we could see considerable enemy activity across the river in the little town of Erpel. A very pretty little town, but it was set on the side of a mountain or a cliff. Uh, it did not lend itself very well to an attack. Uh, if we should move into that area, the enemy would have quite an advantage overlooking our position. However, since we were there to cover the crossing of the infantry, we did pick out numerous targets uh, of opportunity, as we call them, and opened fire and fired across the, the river uh, to assist the infantry in crossing the bridge. As uh, we started across, the only thing that was in my mind was to get off that bridge. The Germans had attempted once to blow it and had failed. And we felt sure, or I felt sure, that the next time the bridge would go. Therefore, uh, we tried to move as fast as we possibly could. However, the leading elements uh, were being shot at by snipers and uh, other people on the other side, and they were moving more cautiously. Then somebody yelled, who has the right tower? I looked over my shoulder. I didn't see anybody move. So I moved over to the right tower. I pushed the door in, and there, there were five Germans huddled around a machine gun. Apparently, the gun had jammed, and they were trying to unjam it. I fired a couple of shots, and I yelled, Honda Hook, which in English means hands up. That was about the only German I knew. They spun around and threw their hands up in the air. I took the machine guns and I threw it out the aperture of the tower, showing the boys that the gun had been knocked out and they had nothing to fear from it. Then, in broken German, English, and whatever, the lang whatever other language I could muster, I tried to make them understand and asked them if there was anyone upstairs. The one kept saying, nine, nine. I didn't know what it meant at the time. Now I know it means no, but I didn't take their word for it. Using the five as a shield, we started to move up the steps to the second floor of the tower. When, I, when we got up there, I found the lieutenant and an enlisted man. The lieutenant made a dive for the corner of the tower. I fired two shots in front of him. He stopped. I don't know what he was diving for. I never stopped to check. All I wanted to do, as I said, was to get off that bridge. I turned around and continued to the attack. Right in front of us, as you get off the bridge, there's the tunnel, the railroad tunnel. Sergeant Kreps and I advanced towards it, and then we each took a hand grenade and threw it into the tunnel. There was a curve in the tunnel, and we got down as far as the curve, and we heard a great many voices talking and yelling and everything else. We couldn't make out how many people or who they were. We didn't know whether it was German soldiers or whether they were German civilians. However, we couldn't take a chance, so we threw a couple more grenades and fired a couple more shots. Captain Friesenhan and I rushed to the tunnel exit, quickly grab a few samples and try for the second time to make an escape from the tunnel. And again, the hand grenades draw down from the tunnel. And at a distance of approximately 120 meters in front of us, a machine gun fires right into the tunnel. Suddenly, there are screams coming from behind us. We turn around and go back. There are casualties among the civilians. A man, a child. 
A bullet wound in the stomach, a gunshot in the leg. The civilians are excited. They scream. They cling to the soldiers, grab them and take away their arms. They come to me. Combat commander, order a ceasefire. Stop it. Our women, our children. I too have a wife at home. What shall I do? An order is an order. This is the most difficult hour of my life. I decide to summon the officers. I cannot carry on. I tell them, according to the Führer's orders, if an officer is no longer in a position to continue combat, he will have to pass on command. And whoever takes over will continue combat. And every officer has to take orders from him down to the lowest rank soldier. Gentlemen, I have an announcement. Which one of you is willing to carry on the battle? I see silence. No one volunteers. Gentlemen, in that case, I'm obliged to pass on the command to the unit. Then I happen to look toward the tunnel exit. Civilians have hoisted the white flag. And they're leaving the tunnel together with the soldiers. It is impossible to go on fighting now. Gentlemen, the white flag has been hoisted without our consent. We are still subject to the regulations of the Geneva Convention. If we continue to fight, we will give the enemy the right to demolish everything. And all these women and children we will be morally responsible for them. I therefore order a ceasefire. Destroy your weapons, and we will be the last ones to leave the tunnel. Meanwhile, the majority of civilians has left the tunnel, together with the soldiers. We five officers who are still in the tunnel, we are now leaving the tunnel too. The last ones to go are Captain Friesenhahn and I. We became prisoners of war of the Americans. During the afternoon, uh, we spent considerable time in adjusting our guns and making notes uh, where various targets were so in the event that we had to fire during the night uh, we would have those targets zeroed in. However, when nighttime came, I was called into a meeting of the officers uh, by our combat commander to be briefed on what our next action would be. I was told at that time that we were going to attempt a crossing of the bridge with our tanks. It was not known if the strength of the bridge was sufficient to hold a tank, but the infantry needed armored support on the other side, and we had to make an effort to get our tanks over there. So we all started across one close behind the other. As a matter of fact, I was so close to the tank in front of me that several times before the crossing was over, I had bumped Speedy Goodson's tank. I had called ahead to him because it was so dark, asking him to make sure that he did not get too far away from me. And he says, Lieutenant, I can't very well get far away from you with you bumping me constantly. Except for the indecision or inability to follow this tape across the, the bridge, we did get across without any incident. The Americans got five tanks and about 120 infantrymen across the Remagen Bridge, a pretty thin force to hold a strategic point like that. But the next morning, all of the American troops within miles around converged on the bridgehead, and within 24 hours, 8,000 
American soldiers had crossed the Remagen Bridge. We established a CP just across from the bridge on the east side, just north of the bridge, about 200 yards. This CP was in what had been the Burgomaster's house at Erpel. The sign was still on the gate post. There was hole through the upstairs where several shells had passed through. And we moved into the basement where we found a supply of wine and beef, which we used while we were living in that place. My only souvenir of this attack is the sign which was taken off of the gate post of the Burgomaster's house. This was the first command post of the Allied forces on the east bank of the Rhine. It was from this command post in the cellar of the Burgomaster's house at Erpel that we commanded the development of the initial bridgehead across the Rhine River. Beginning that morning and continuing for a number of days later, there was a constant stream of American troops from the west bank to the east bank of the river. As soon as we uh, could, we threw four divisions across on the east side of the Rhine to form a bridgehead. The Germans countered by throwing 11 German divisions against us to try to push us back or at least contain us. Uh, Fortunately for us, those were divisions that had been fighting in the Bulge and the Ardennes and were very much reduced in strength and effectiveness. One of the divisions, for example, they threw against us was the uh, second Panzer Division, which had been badly chewed up and suffered terrific casualties. Another was the 5th Airborne in the German Division, which had also suffered terrific casualties. So with even with 11 divisions thrown against our four, they were not able to drive us back across the river. In fact, we could expand almost at will against them, and we gave orders to the 1st Division, to the 1st Army, to have those divisions expand uh, advance about 1,000 yards a day so that they would not be mined in and uh, therefore would be able to break out when the time came. The um, capture of the Remagen Bridge was of the utmost significance to the uh, of future uh, operations. As uh, from the beginning, our plans had called for the complete isolation and capture of the Ruhr, so as to deprive uh, Germany of that great uh, uh, arsenal uh, manufacture. Well now, by getting across to the south of the Ruhr at Remagen, and uh, then waiting for the big uh, push to the north of the Ruhr, we made it possible to surround the whole area much uh, more rapidly and much more securely than had we attacked only at one place. Hitler was hopping mad when the news of Remagen reached Berlin. He immediately demanded the heads of those who had been responsible for this treason. He set up a drumhead court-martial headed by a confirmed Nazi, General Hubner. The court-martial left Berlin on the 10th of March, three days after Remagen was captured. It uh, included three officers, none of whom had any training in military justice. They allowed no defense counsel for the accused. Three majors and one lieutenant were dragged before the court-martial, harangued, and sentenced within an hour. They were taken out the next morning into a small wood about 25 miles from the Rhine River, shot by a firing squad in the back of their heads, buried in ten inches of soil. This was Hitler's quick answer to the capture of Remagen Bridge. Hitler threw in everything he had in an effort to destroy the Remagen Bridge. He fired the deadly V-2s against the bridge. He mobilized a couple of big 17-centimeter railroad guns to fire in their big charges.
most of all, he thought he could destroy the bridge through underwater swimmers. There was a special group of swimmers that had been trained in Vienna, all under 29 years of age, in perfect physical condition. They went into the water several miles above the bridge and swam underneath water armed with charges that they were going to put against the bridge. However, they were picked up by real powerful American searchlights mounted on tanks that were sweeping the river during the night. These swimmers never did reach their objective and they were captured by the Americans a mile or so below the bridge. With reference to the traffic across the bridge, as you can well understand, there was only the one bridge to start with. Engineers were brought forward immediately and started the construction of ferries and then bridges across the river. Initially, almost all of the traffic was from west to east. The only time we reversed the traffic was to take back the wounded. Later, when ferries were in operation and the Ponton bridges came into use, the traffic was both ways and the bridge was closed for repairs. For a period of about seven days, my unit, the Combat Engineer Battalion, worked hand in hand with a, a bridge construction outfit that was more or less in charge of uh, erecting the dismembered uh, pieces of iron steel that were uh, the upper part of the bridge. Ours was mainly the job of the uh, flooring of the bridge. This was a railroad bridge, by the way. And uh, we worked feverishly around the clock, 24 hours a day in different shifts, to build a Bailey Bridge, to get treadway on the bridge so that we could give the boys some support or get some equipment to them that were fighting so hard on the other side of the river. During this time, there was constantly periods where enemy aircraft was coming in, strafing the bridge, uh, dropping bombs trying to knock this bridge out. There was artillery fire. We stopped periodically to get under cover for these. One time I remember, rather stupid of me, uh, enemy aircraft came over and as it did I tried to find something to hide under and it was the Bailey Bridge that we were constructing. And after the strafing was over, I realized that this is probably the worst place that I could have been because if that bridge had been hit, I'd have been caught or trapped underneath there. But these are the things that uh, you remember afterwards at any rate. This was a constant turmoil. It was uh, men racing against time that we needed help for those fellows over there and we were working real hard, equipment flying all over the place. In addition to our job as engineers on this bridge, the 276 also took its part in the security measures. That is that we had uh, places of observation at the bridgehead that uh, we could maybe counter a, uh, an attack that might be made on the bridge. At any rate, about 3.30 in the afternoon, I'd say, uh, my unit, that is my company, was taking over the security of this bridge from another unit, also in our, our battalion. And at 3.30, I was up on the bridge along with, uh, I think, a Lieutenant Enos, and we were comparing where the vantage points were for these guards. And at 3.45 or some such time, we walked toward the western bank of the river where I had my men stationed in a truck, and uh, we had just about decided that these were good places to have the people. And mind you, at this time, the railroad engineers were still working, and we also had a deadline of about five o'clock that evening that the bridge for the first time was going to be opened up to the heavy equipment traffic and everybody was working feverishly to get this job done for that particular time. At any rate, about quarter of four, Lieutenant Enos and I were down uh, at the bridgehead or at the uh, western bank and we were discussing a few little details and he was pulling some of his men off and I was just getting ready to send mine up when suddenly we heard something like rifle fire and we looked up in the air as if to look for aircraft but instead there was uh, dust coming up rising from the bridge and it seemed to totter a little and it seemed to sway toward us and then the center section of the bridge started to cave in we had 
trucks up on on the uh, bridge that part of it was on the center section and part on the uh, abutment side so that this truck I can remember just folded up like an envelope uh, pieces of equipment and pieces of the bridge were tumbling down and I think our first reaction was to take cover that either the bridge had been hit or for some reason that it was going to fall and then just as rapidly as you can well imagine that whole big structure disappeared in front of us and now we're all running to see what we can do about fishing people out of the river that uh, it was almost a bubbling uh, roaring noise that it almost seemed like uh, the river itself had been turned into a boiling pot with all this debris falling in and men screaming and uh, you could see fellows were hurt and, and grasping for something to hang on to and going down the river where eventually they were picked up but ours was a case of real turmoil then. Lots of reasons contributed to the collapse of the Ludendorff Bridge on the 17th of March. In the first place the German demolition on the 7th of March had really shattered one side of the bridge and weakened it seriously. Then when the Americans put planking on the bridge to cover it over and cover over the holes which had been blown in the bridge, this added about 50 tons of weight to the bridge. The, there was a great deal of heavy pounding from the tanks and the vehicles that crossed. The German artillery shells tore a lot of additional holes in the bridge. Then there were the bombs that the Luftwaffe dropped on the bridge itself. One of the real reasons, I think, in addition to this that contributed to the collapse was the amount of heavy equipment that the engineers moved on to the bridge. Cranes, electric arc welders, air compressors, all these things set up vibrations. The American artillery batteries, and particularly anti-aircraft batteries that set up vibrations that caused the, all the ground to shake around the bridge. I don't think that you could say that any single one of these factors caused the collapse of the bridge, but the combination of them caused the structure just to weaken and die on the 17th of March. The action of the people actually at the scene of the capture was uh, uh, beyond praise. Every man in the whole command approaching that bridge knew that it was mine. They knew that all the other bridges that uh, they had seen were blown down into the water at that moment. And actually, of course, the Ludendorff Bridge was mine. Yet without a moment's hesitation, the local commanders, the platoon, company, and battalion commanders, and indeed I think General Hogue, who had the co entire combat uh, combat team hesitated not a second. They rushed the bridge, went across, and um, and there was an attempt to uh, blow it up while they were on it. But there was a, a a faulty fuse or something else of the kind, and that foiled that. But in the mean, but they had the attack had been so sudden and so unexpected on the part of the Germans that uh, that the thing uh, just was a complete success. We had losses. True, but they were minor as compared to the great prize that we won. So much has been said and written about Ramagan. It was said that the bridge fell into the hands of the Americans through treason, sabotage, and cowardice. I guarantee that what I told you is true. Neither sabotage nor treason were involved. The bridge was lost to the Americans. The officers tried, and the German soldiers tried, up to the very last moment, to do their duty. Even if it was a battle of unequal weapons, and we did not have at our disposal what we needed, we did what we could. And you American soldiers who perhaps see this film, would not consider it an honor to know that the bridge of Remagen fell into your hands through treason. Your comrades of the past, a Miller, a Delizio, and others, fought for the bridge, and there was bloodshed. Remember, the Americans conquered the bridge in rage.
Well, to us at the time, uh, it was just another job. It was an objective that had to be taken, and we went ahead and took it to the best of our ability. No one, I don't believe, uh, thought it was uh, of great significance at the time, at least, we'll say, at our level anyway. Maybe the higher-ups uh, figured it was a... Uh, it had importance, but to us, it was just a job that had to be done, and we done it. Captain Carl Friesenhahn, when I interviewed him right after the war, asked what awards the first Americans had received for crossing the bridge. And when I told him they had received distinguished service crosses, he responded, they deserved them and then some. They saw us trying to blow up that bridge and by all odds it should have been blown up while they were crossing it. In my mind, they were the greatest heroes in the whole war.